So Sajeev is going to talk about how CI can make dollars from thin air. I think I'll retire and just do this in a minute. So uh, please give it up for Sajid. Oh, hello. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Sweet. Um, well, my name's Sajid Lahani. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. So I've flown about 26 hours to get here. And yeah, basically I work as a senior red teamer and a senior pen tester in Privasec. Surprise. And yeah, it's pretty cool. I get to go around doing everything that I really enjoy, the security side of things. So I'm actually on the other side of the fence. Uh, I'm the offense and I go and attack everything, break everything. And today we're gonna talk a bit about how we can make offense come into security and how we can actually use the offensive mindset to go and secure things too. So I like to do my talks in a bit of a different way though. I like to give everyone a bit of an incentive and try to bring people into the talk. So I'm going to do a bit of a giveaway today. There are going to be four questions inside the talk. So pay attention, I'm quite serious. Four questions, and if you can answer any of the questions, the first person to answer it gets a one-month subscription to Pentester Labs. Now, um, you might not know what Pentester Labs is. It's basically a tool for teaching pen testing. It's my favorite tool and was actually written by my first boss. And um, it's really, really cool because it'll give you practical knowledge about how to attack and it'll give you write-ups for it too. So it's actually really good. So to get started, we're gonna talk a bit about the story, how I came up with this subject. Now, um, I've actually been out of uni for about two years, so I'm 25. And I, well, I really, really do like to eat food and drink. Surprise. And we basically, well, I have a favorite pub in Melbourne called the Sherlock Holmes pub. It's actually a really nice pub. It's a British, you know, layout. You go down a set of stairs, it's dark underground, and your phone doesn't work, which is even better because now you're secluded and you don't have to worry about anything. So I went there with my mentor, Jeff, and his best friend, Mark, who's a security architect. And we basically sat down and I got talking, saying, okay, I want to buy a house soon, but buying a house in Melbourne in the eastern suburbs where it's actually safe, you're not going to get stabbed, is pretty hard. I mean, a house costs probably about a million bucks, which as a 25-year-old is not easy to get. So, surprise, surprise, we thought we'd come up with better ways to make some money. So we took a bit of a break, came back to it, and oh, obviously, alongside any kind of drinking session comes a bit of betting. So anyone who comes up with the best concept was basically going to be the one who got shouted drinks. Awesome. More drinks, more food. So start of the competition. One week break, everyone came up with their ideas. So we started off with Jeff's idea. Why don't we write a malicious XSS payload, so running JavaScript, to run in other people's browsers, make a popular website, or we could use a stored cross-site scripting bug, and go shove it out to everyone, and mine bitcoins through their browsers. It works, it's great. However, it'll get you arrested very quickly. So Mark came up with the fact that why don't we just write some ransomware? Very easy, there's actually a few softwares that are generated for you. Um, but in actual fact, yet again illegal and will get you arrested extremely quickly. So the next thing is why don't we pop the internet of shit? Oh, by the way, I'm Australian, so I will swear a lot, sorry. Um, the answer to that is because you're going to get arrested yet again. Very, very easy to get arrested in InfoSec. So actually, let's start off with this. First giveaway question, what's the name of my favorite bar? Can anyone answer that? Shoot. Sweet. Can you talk to me after and I'll give you a subscription? Um, so the basis of my talk today is what I ended up coming up with as a solution for how to make money. And let's just say it works. Full disclaimer though, let's start it off by saying you do not have permission to do this. I did have written permission. Unless you have written permission, do not try any of this at home. Um, also keep an eye out for the terms of services. Just because it doesn't say anything specifically, it can be quite you know, conclusive with legal terms, which I don't understand. But yeah, just make sure you get a good look at things before you go crazy. So what's in this talk for you? One, we're gonna talk about how to make money. Two, we're gonna identify different attack scenarios. And three, we're gonna try to figure out how to save money 
So in the end, everything is about money. So just as a quick rundown, does everyone know what a CI is? I assume you probably know that better than I do. Um, basically, just for anyone who doesn't, it's a continuous integration server. So it's integrating different parts of code, large blocks of it together. Maybe you have three or four different um, development teams. We fuse everything together in a one place and run your different tests. So you could have unit tests checking you know, if integers are correct, if you're getting the right values, if you handle weird input correctly and things like that. You could also have different standard checks. You could have security inside it. You could have things like static code analysis checks, et cetera, et cetera. But my favorite part of this is actually you can do multiple environment checks. So as a security professional, we have to write tools that runs for everyone because security people are dumb. They go ahead and try to run everything on any system they have. And so we have to be compatible with Macs. We have to be compatible with different types of Linux and distributions, God. And then we also have to be compatible with Windows, which is a nightmare. And yeah. So how does this actually make us money? Now, does everyone know what a bug bounty is? Got a few nods, but not too many. Cool. So a bug bounty is basically companies come and pay you to go and find bugs in their systems. But these are security vulnerabilities. So a perfect example actually is Julian. Julian's from Mozilla. Mozilla pays me a fair bit of money to go and find security flaws. As soon as I find one, they pay me three, four, five grand straight away, no questions asked, to um, for not disclosing the vulnerability to the public and responsibly giving it to them so they can go and fix it. It's a great way of getting cheap labor very quickly from thousands of people, but in a smart manner. Because, I mean, if you're smart enough to get it, well, you just made some money very, very quickly. So we're going to use bug bounties initially to make some money. You can actually do things like this. Now, this is one of my favorite platforms. And my favorite one is actually Bug Crowd because I'm a Bug Crowd ambassador in Melbourne. But my second favorite is HackerOne. HackerOne is really cool because it allows you to publicly post out vulnerabilities, but it'll also pop on layers of encryption to make sure that no one else can see it until it's publicly disclosed. So this one was actually a vulnerability that a guy found, which is basically going into the Travis CI logs and finding GitHub personal tokens. So this gives you full access to a person's GitHub account, um, depending on what type of tokens they are, obviously. But in this case, he had push, um, push access, pull access, and everything, private repositories, inclusive of things within the HackerOne organization, which made it very, very, very scary. Um, HackerOne straight away paid out 2,000 bucks. Then you can also look at Automatic. Automatic, I believe, are the makers of WordPress.com. Um, don't quote me on that. And basically, yet again, Travis CI logs, open to the public, it goes out, and they have to pay 500 bucks because someone couldn't handle their tokens properly. Yet again, in this case, it was Slack channels. So someone put up their Slack tokens, and that got leaked. Grab Taxi paid out $7,000 for this. It's pretty awesome. And yet again, another GitHub token leak from Snapchat. And this was worth $15,000. I do not make that much yet. So that is a fair bit of money for a single day's finding. So giveaway number two. What was the name of the bug bounty platform? Wrong. What was it? Yep, cool, so come and see me later. And yeah, so moving on. Basically, we've identified one way of making money, but now we're going to look at other ways of making money through maybe, oh, by the way, anything that we do here, the investment, we say it's making money out of thin air, but you do have some investment. You need to have a laptop and the internet, but I assume everyone does have that. Um, in this case, now we're going to look at Travis. So. Before we get into anything else, we're going to look at threat modeling. Why threat modeling? Or oh, FYI, people here will definitely know threat modeling better than I do. I am a full and through red teamer. I don't know this stuff well. However, I try my best. So threat modeling questions, I like to ask four of them. What are we actually building? What can go wrong in it? How can we actually go about making it better? And did we actually do a good job? So first, let's look at Travis CI. What are we building here? We start off with a development environment. We try to figure out what we're actually building. 
we push it to GitHub, see how it goes, everything goes well, it goes fine, no conflicts, goes straight to Travis CI. Travis CI builds everything, puts it all together, sees if it passes the checks. It does, awesome, pushes it to production. Job done. Pretty simple workflow. I assume that's like the most baseline thing you can have. Now, why are we going after Travis CI? I mean, there's Circle CI, there's Jenkins, there's a lot of different things. It's because Travis CI is actually really good software and they're extremely generous. They give out free subscriptions to everyone. So anyone who has a GitHub account um, and has open source projects can get Travis CI for free. Unlimited number of repositories, unlimited number of commits. So you can do a commit a second and they'll still process it. And the cool thing that not many people know about, which we found out testing, is it actually has 50 minute build times. So you can essentially run a container for 50 minutes after which it will get it, well, terminated. So how can we actually abuse this? This is basically giving us free CPU cycles with bandwidth, which is awesome because I don't know if you guys know how bad Australia is, but Australia's internet speeds are abysmal. We're, one of, we're actually worse than a lot of third world countries. So for a bit, this is actually how I sped up my internet. Pass it through a container, job done, don't care. So what we can do here is we can use containers to leak certain information about a server we can go ahead and use it as um, a DDoS node, so put up, say, 100 different containers and attack one single server really, really quickly and hopefully take it down. We can sell that as a service. We can use it as a command and control server, so putting you know, one single server up, controlling a whole bunch of other servers, and it terminates after 50 minutes, after which another one comes up and it controls all the other servers that you're doing, so you could hypothetically host a botnet with it. You could do distributed Bitcoin mining, so you're actually going through and mining Bitcoins for 50 minutes on each container, do 100 commits. Now you have 50 nodes doing Bitcoin mining for you for free. And last, since I'm a pen tester, password cracking. You have no clue how many times we get password hashes inside a pen test. We regularly get them, and we have to spend a lot of money to go and actually crack each of these passwords. So this is a cheap and easy way of doing that. Push up a commit, let the container actually deal with it, nice and easy. So this is basically free CPU cycles, which implies a supercomputer, pretty much, in like the most loose terms possible, but you can spin up your own supercomputer for free thanks to Travis CI. And now we're actually gonna go through a little bit of a recorded demo, heavily edited, to be very honest, um, of what, we're, what we can actually do with one single commit and one single container. So here we go, we start off with an EC2 instance, Apache 2 running, very simple. Come over to GitHub, and you can see I have a Python script which literally just opens up a thousand socket connections. I make a change to trigger Travis CI, and I go and reload Travis CI. It's running, takes ages. And there you go, it's opened up a thousand socket connections. Now I go and check up my server to see what's going on, and my server's dead. So one single commit, one single container, took down a micro um, EC2 instance nice and easy. Now imagine doing that, spinning up a million of them against something like GitHub. Someone would buy that service, hell, GitLab probably would, and you've got a service going, nice and easy. So basically that's making money out of thin air in a very, very simple and easy concept. So we can make it through bounties, we can make it through DDoSing, we can make it through distributed Bitcoin mining really, really, really easy. But, so I, basically what happened was I went to my friends and said, this is exactly what I've, I can do, and this is how I can make money really, really quickly. And they said, that's awesome. But since Mark is a security architect, his first thing is, how are you gonna fix it? He'll buy me another round of drinks if I can go and fix each of these issues. Turns out, fixing them is not that easy, um, especially when you're an attacker by you know, mindset, extremely hard. So I went ahead and actually started learning about threat modeling, which is a really cool concept. Basically, um, there's a guy in Microsoft, I think, who came up with an acronym called STRIDE. And basically, we're gonna go through what STRIDE is and try to go and identify things that can go wrong and how we can fix them. 
So STRIDE stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information gathering, sorry, information disclosure, uh, denial of service, and escalation of privileges. So we're going to go through each and every one of that acronym and see what we can do. So what can go wrong? In spoofing, we can pretend to be someone else. So this could be different levels of pretending. We could pretend to be Travis CI, so hypothetically spin up a company that looks exactly like Travis CI, pretend to be the company themselves, and you know do any nefarious amount of tasks. We can, uh, well, hell, Travis CI might have been infiltrated by another company, and now they might be going rogue, doing different things, and as an organization, you have to always take in risks like this. If you're, say, the Chinese government, you need to watch out for things because Travis CI is an American company, as far as I know, and they might have already been infiltrated by the NSA. So now your secrets are going to get leaked to the NSA. You have an issue. Um, another thing that you can also think about is using a container as a proxy server. So we can route our traffic, say, I'm going to go and try to hack McDonald's. It's because you do. And I don't want to be seen. So for 50 minutes, I can have all of my traffic routed through Travis CI. Spin up a single proxy container, let it go through that, and no one will know exactly what hit them. Um, and after 50 minutes, your tracks are kind of covered, but not completely. But hey, it's better than nothing. So what are we actually going to do about this? In actual fact, um, you're going to have to accept the fact that Travis CI is trusted. So I mean, there's nothing I can really say about that. For anything related to third-party um, app misconfig, you're really going to have to actually sit down and read the permissions before you hit the green button, as tempting as it is, because I trust me, I always hit that green button. Um, do read the uh, permission checks and make sure you give authorization to the correct applications. The next thing is for how to fix a proxy server, the easiest thing is ingress rules. Keep an eye out for the types of rules that are actually there. Depending on what is currently laid out and the amount of um, behavior kind of checks. So an example is if you're testing your code, are you ever going to need external access from, uh, to the server that's being testing? The answer is no. You don't need something to actually go and listen on um, the internet for specific ports. So that's one easy way of blocking proxy servers. Just don't allow such behavior. Um, now, giveaway number three. What were the four questions? Can anyone say that approximately? Shoot. You have a picture, don't you? That's smart. Awesome. Oh, even better. Yep. So, see me afterwards. Okay, cool. So, now we're going to move on to tampering. So, that's basically modification of data or code. Um, it's escaping containers in different ways, so that could be things like a Docker escape vulnerability and things like that. And it's also the segregation between each of these containers. How segregated are they? Can you jump from one to another? Can you actually you know, do anything crazy? Can you spoof traffic and things like that? So after a fair bit of research, we found out that it is extremely hard to escape a container. However, thanks to Docker's vulnerabilities and the security researchers attacking Docker, very, very regularly. Uh, this year, there was actually a bug that was released, um, I think. And it would basically allow you to break out of a container and go straight and take over root access of the host, because Docker runs as root most of the time. And when something like that does happen, then oh, whoops. Um, when something like that does happen, you actually get to take over the um, major server, which implies all, say, 800 of the containers running on the server are now yours. Now, instead of this could be a private server, this could be a public server, we don't know. But now that means every single container ever spun up on Travis CI is now in your control. You can go and tamper with every, anyone else's code. You can go read their code. You can go leak secrets about them. And that's catastrophic. Um, we know as a fact places like Uber use it. So hell, you can just go steal their secrets, no problems. Um, as for segregation, we did do a bit of research on that, and we weren't able to find anything particularly crazy, so they've done a pretty good job. And they're actually a really smart team and very, very you know, nice to deal with, so kudos to them. So the next thing is repudiation. That's basically claiming to have not done something that you have done, or it could be you know, anything related to your logs. So. Basically, every single time you run a build, 
you have logs for each and every part of it, basically saying this command was run, this is the output, this command was run, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the question is, are these logs removable? Can you cover your tracks for anything around here? Turns out there's a big red button, and that lets you do it. It's awesome. The only catch is you have to be a maintainer, which, awkwardly enough, for a lot of open, open source projects, is extremely easy to get. Um, all you have to do is do like five commits, be active on issues, and let you be a maintainer right away. It's awesome. Um, Travis CI also states that it is a permanent delete. However, they've never proven the fact that it is. Um, it's very hard to prove, so I don't blame them. But this implies that should there be, if it is permanent, then um, there could be issues with things like incident response. So say someone actually goes, pushes something malicious and manages somehow to remove their commit, then you can basically go remove the logs and no one will ever know about that and you have malicious code running around inside your repository and no one can do anything, which is pretty scary. The next we're gonna move on to the I, which is information disclosure. So we're gonna talk about how people love to expose information inside repositories. It's really cool. Um, I've made a fair bit of money off this. When people go into their um, Travis CI you know, builds or be it um, inside their actual source code and go and expose things like GitHub tokens, just as um, Julian was saying about Firefox, we find it not every day, but probably every week. Um, someone's gone and leaked credentials, like, um, it, We've got some pretty fun examples of it. Um, another fun one that I really, really enjoy is um, processing tools. So people love to actually do static code analysis now. It's actually really cool. They do static code analysis for security. And um, a lot of these tools actually go and expose reports for you, which that's exactly what they're supposed to do. But the issue is that they expose them inside the logs, which implies everyone in the world can go and read them. Now, that's literally handing everyone a report saying, these are our security vulnerabilities, come and expose them. And yeah, so you've basically given attackers a list of things to attack. Um, it's actually really, really fun. And that's how I've got a bunch of CVEs, just reading other people's reports, saying, oh, this one's actually a bug. Let me go check that out. I make a proof of concept, send it off to them, and they're like, oh yeah, that's a bug, whoops. And they go and fix it. Actual fact, literally just reading things. It's Kind of sad. And yeah, the next thing that I really do want to also point out is people love to expose sensitive endpoints. Um, they kind of go out and just list out endpoints that should not be accessible with the passwords. And yeah, we just kind of go as an attacker and read them and attack them. It's awesome. So our first issue is the disclosure of API keys and passwords. And for that, I would usually suggest using secure environment variables, but we're going to talk a bit about that in a little bit. The next thing is we, um, identification of endpoints. Probably don't keep them in your logs or your code. If you, know, you can replace them in different ways, you don't need them to be, if they're sensitive and they shouldn't be there, they shouldn't be there, so don't put them in. And static code analysis tools, either keep your reports private or patch the bugs because it's really not acceptable if you're giving out people vulnerabilities because that just makes my life more interesting and you don't want that. So I was talking about secure environment variables and basically it turns out that Travis CI has made a pretty cool thing. Um, this was actually a bug made by, uh, found by Andy Wegner. I think it was in 2016 to 2017. And it's basically a flaw that he found within the way Travis CI does secure environment variables. Now, to a normal developer, or pretty much anyone, they'd assume if it says, if a vendor says it's secure, it's secure. You're gonna go ahead with that, because trust me, I started using this too, until I read this blog. And, I mean, as a usual person, you don't go ahead and try testing things, so it's like, okay, cool, it's gonna work, no biggie. And then you go and actually look into it a bit deeper. How does it actually know which one's which? The answer is we leak them. So the way this actually works is string matching. It'll actually go through and match each word with each other. If the key of the environment variable matches and the value matches, it will pop in the word secure. If you put a space in between, what happens? It leaks it. It's literally as simple as that. It doesn't actually follow the application flow at all. It just says, 
yep, there you go, keep it. And it's exposed in the logs. Uh, there was also a fun little bug in Travis CI once upon a time, which um, as soon as you put in a pull request, it would actually run with the secure environment variables. Um, and basically, what happens with that is, should someone actually have that configuration put into their Travis CI config, you're now leaking someone else's credentials left, right, and center with a simple pull request. Just pretty awesome as an attacker. Uh, as a defender, you've literally used something that says it's secure, and you just got bitten for it. So, sorry. So how can we actually fix that without causing too much trouble? The answer, use something like a KMS. Now, to be very honest, I don't completely understand what goes on inside them. All I know is lots of encryption, something, something, it's hard to break into, and yeah. But um, basically, use something like a KMS or a key management system, and it's, yeah, a service you can use in a lot of different cloud well, services or infrastructure, and yeah. So we're gonna move on to DOS, or denial of service. So the first type of DOS is bandwidth. You can actually use these containers to consume a lot of bandwidth and um, send out a lot of bandwidth really, really easily, really, really quickly. The equivalent of smashing the F5 button. You could also do things like distributed denial of service. So GitHub got hit, I think, in 2015 or 2016 or something. And the Australian Census, which is a very fun story, um, they didn't actually get hit by a um, denial of service attack. It's because of, and I hope this is not recorded, but because of IBM's incompetence, uh, and they were too cheap to put up a bunch of servers, they um, actually got dosed by normal users. People went to actually do the census on the last day, as normal people do, and 24 million people went in to use the service, and it died. And yeah, basically census went on to going on to writing again, which is great. <sighs> yeah, so then after that we have things like traffic routing. So you can have this really cool policeman who's dancing there tell people, say, you know, pop up a DNS server on your container and try to spoof the DNS going to other places. Now, say one of your packages goes and tries to load something else from, I don't know, google.com, then we can spin up a DNS server and try to get it to go to your google.com or your web server, whatever you want. Nice and easy. Now, how do we actually fix these things? Turns out that um, distributed denial of service attacks, it's a little bit hard to fix, but usually you can fix a majority of it by limiting the amount of connections and traffic going through. So don't allow people to throw out gigabits. It's pointless. Um, don't allow a thousand socket connections. Probably allow 10 and you're good. Um, the next thing is routing traffic. From our research, it's actually really hard to do that, and they do have proper segregation, so we weren't able to. However, I'm sure that one or the other container you know, providers have stuffed that up, so keep an eye out. The next thing we're gonna look at is elevation of privileges, or how can we go further? And basically, that's basically looking at authorization checks and how we can stuff up authorization and misusing maybe sudo. So, fun fact, Travis CI lets you do anything you want with sudo. Which, I mean, if you're going to install things on your container, makes perfect sense. But sudo is the only thing that you can actually, well, the only thing you really require to do things like Docker escapes. So it's a feature, but it's also the biggest weakness because that's exactly what you need to go and break out and take over other people's containers. And yeah. So in the end, did we actually do a good job? Did we go through and identify each vulnerability, each place, and everything? My friend Mark thought so, so I think so. And giveaway number four, what is the full form of stride? Shoot. Holy crap, I did not think anyone would get that. <laughs> nice, yeah, give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> so a quick summary of everything we've said today. I made about 20 grand off doing random crap like this which I'm not completely proud of, but I kind of am. Um, we basically went through identified attack surfaces and found different ways to break into things and destroy them. We've also found ways to fix each and every one of them. So that's a good pat on the back. And yeah, in the end, I won a lot of drinks and got 
pretty intoxicated and um, trying to pass this on to everyone else. I want everyone to go and think about the different types of bugs that they've found or you know, different types of software they've used. Just because you use a software doesn't mean that you can't think about the security behind it. Security may not be your job, as Tanya said. Security is for everyone. It is a part of everyone's job. And as long as you put your part into it, just because you're a developer or a solutions architect or something does not mean that security is not your job. It means that you can think about it and you can make the difference. You can save your company money, you can go out, look at different issues, talk to someone in a red team like me, and find maybe different vectors to attack, teach us something and we'll give you a share of the bounty if we find anything, so you can make money off it too. And if you're on my side of the fence, then it'll teach you how to hack things better because doing this I learned a fuck ton. And yeah, any questions? Shit. Uh, let's just say I don't completely have um, permission despite Jenkins, and we did find some fun stuff on Jenkins. So, anything else? Uh, frankly, no, I don't. I, I'm not well versed enough to be able to say anything, but I can read up and let you know if you want. Oh, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure that you. Oh, sweet. Yep. Sweet. Thanks.